Hi, Sav. Hey. Yes. Um, is there a question? Recorded. He always has a question. <laughs> it's being, <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. <laughs> Applicable. <laughs> How can I see the participants or the viewers? So that is actually not a feature, I'm sorry. When you're sharing your screen, you can't see us. Um, so I can read off questions in the chat box for you. Well, I, I, see the, no, I see the chat box uh, and I see, oh, you you. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see everything. I just don't see who the viewers are. Oh, if you scroll down, you may be able to see, like we only have one viewer. Um, because it says five. The way okay, yep, got it. So Simo, Minerva, Stephanie. Okay, I see them. Got it. I got yes. it. So uh, the way that it also works is that people who are, people can just view and then they can hit join if they would like to connect with you directly, meaning via camera and mic. Um, and then they can disconnect if they are, if they want to hop off. So that's an option. And we will encourage people to like unmute themselves and join and, and ask their questions if they're interested. Okay. All right, let's uh, give it uh, five minutes. I know that people were going to the previous session, right? Yeah, they should be coming out of, of the previous session right now. Okay. And I have a tough crowd. Hey everyone. You have some fans, Sev, <laughs> specifically Joe. <Jeff. laughs> Thank you, Nasir. Appreciate it, man. I need it. We'll give it uh, two more minutes. We'll, we'll start at 12.05. We'll, we'll have time. And I think most of you have not taken this workshop before, probably other than Serge who's probably seen the content. I don't remember, Ram Ramsey, have you seen the details before? Or Joe? It's typing. <laughs> it does not. Hey, hey, Sev. Hi, hey. Reem. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Yeah, we're giving it one more minute till 12.05, and then we'll start. Yeah, definitely. I know people might maybe want to take some yeah. So why don't we do this just so that we can save a little bit more time. Uh, I'm going to go to the first ask. Um, so this is a first time we're doing this virtually, but there's actually an activity. Um, so we've given a little bit more time to go through any of the difficulties we may encounter, but we at some point we're going to split this into two sessions uh, and then have people call each other and then come back. So just uh, if you have issues, just reach out to Reem or Eli um, as we're going through it. But in the meantime, uh, as you're kind of trickling in, if you don't mind, uh, and uh, Reem, did I get your email right at my LCN? Yeah. If you don't mind, please send a quick email. Take time now to do it, and then if you can, just say confirm in the chat. Um, we're going to send you material at some point in the in the workshop uh, for the activity. Uh, Reem will be doing that, but if you can take a minute now, just either IM her or email her, preferably 
uh, so that she has your email, that she knows you're in the workshop, and then uh, she'll send out the material when the time is right. All right, I'm just gonna wait. I think, uh, so officially we've started. Uh, if you don't mind just making sure you send that email and then we'll, we'll, we'll do that next. Joe, are you confirming the email that's already on the screen? All right. All right, there is a perfect setup here, okay. We encourage everyone to send an email. Just speaking of uh, personal experience, I attended one of these sessions before with Sev, and it was one of my favorite ever that the LCN, that the LCN has ever hosted. Um, so it's, it's very exciting. Um, and, you know, please, please do send your emails and participate in this activity as it's going to be really, really fun. Uh, Nasri, set, uh, Ali, set the expectations low, man. <laughs> well, it's, it's not that good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh man, I can't. Wait. All right. Um, so everybody on the call, if uh, if you've done it, just can you just hit OK or confirm or a thumbs up, however you want to do it, uh, so that we can move forward. And we'll we'll have time at the end in case you didn't do it to to re we'll remind you um, to do it. Okay. All right. So with that, let's start. Um, I think uh, some people have already taken care of it. All right, so uh, before I do any of the intros, uh, and please use the chat as kind of the main feature here to uh, to put in your uh, responses, but uh, want to see if, uh, how do I do it? all right, and I'm gonna do my best here because I can't see both screens when I do this, but uh, I obviously put some of the answers up already. Uh, can you still see the screen? Can you confirm you can see the screen, Reem? Yes, we can. Yeah. So when do you negotiate uh, is a question that I, uh, I like to ask up front. And unfortunately, I don't know how to uh, make these not show up without also losing the full screen capability. Um, let me try one more thing. Let me see if this will work. Oh, it does not. All right, so I'm going to take uh, one break at some point just so I can fix it real quickly. But um, I guess, uh, so when do you negotiate? And, and this is something that uh, I like asking because at least in my line of work and in my professional world, uh, I feel like I'm always negotiating. There really isn't a time or a framework or a box that you're like, okay, now you're negotiating, right? And uh, uh, given the diverse group here, you'd be negotiating different times. You'd be negotiating at different things. Um, but like the easiest one is, as you're kind of leaving your school or changing jobs, salary, right? You're within a job. How do you ask for a raise? Uh, when you're managing projects, uh, let me ask this. What, what would you be negotiating when you're managing projects? I'm just gonna wait. Schedule, right? Time, right? Excellent. And I know there's a project management workshop happening at the same time as well. So, uh, scope, exactly. Right, uh, you're negotiating resources, how many people you can have on the project, right? Obviously budget, which is the next one. You may be doing that as part of a project. You may be doing that as part of a leader within a group uh, as you're looking at you know, your teams and what you need to do for the year, the projects you have, you're requesting budgets. Um, you may be negotiating contracts, right? Any other, uh, and th these could be like purchasing contracts, these could be sales contracts, these could be scope contracts. Um, Salary, like uh, you know, employment contracts, right? It's not just about the salary. There's other elements. Uh, anything else uh, you think you can be negotiating? All 
And if this was in person, I'd be calling on people right and left. But uh, let's see, Hiba, what do you think you'd be negotiating? No. Just give an example, Minerva, if you have it. Yeah, of course, who to collaborate with, who you want to work with. Uh, if you have spouses, if you have kids, you're negotiating with them all the time. What do you want to do versus what they want to do? How do you get them, your kids to behave, right? What do you uh, incite them with? What are the incentives you put for them? Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't really. So really, you're negotiating practically all the time um, for a lot of different things. You just probably aren't thinking about it as a negotiation. But anytime there's a give and take, right, when there's an ask, you're technically negotiating. Uh, so with that, just a little bit uh, about me. So my undergrad at USC, um, uh, my my major was actually in engineering and as well as math uh, and economics. Uh, really didn't go into the field though, and ended up joining GE's leadership commercial leadership program, which is mostly on the sales side. Um, and then um, I once I got out of that rotation, I became an, a full time salesperson for wholesale distribution, and and really that's where I started without knowing that I had to do negotiations all the time when we were doing pricing, when we were doing project management. Um, and really GE opened up my view on how negotiations can play a big role. So a lot of some of the thoughts in this workshops are still things I learned from that particular training almost 10 years ago now, um, when I was a part of that leadership program. Uh, and then after uh, I did my uh, sales uh, kind of stint uh, in the world, I, I, I did my MBA. Uh, I decided to kind of change tracks. I went from being on the sales side of the world to the purchasing side of the world, and I joined Amgen. It's a biotech company out in Thousand Oaks, which is about 20 miles or 30 miles west of Los Angeles, downtown LA. And I joined their global strategic sourcing team, which is the team that um, kind of sits above buyers and looks at the way you spend your money within the company, kind of helps it segment it into categories of what you're buying and then putting strategies and then negotiating the contract. So uh, right out of like MBA school, uh, it was cool because I had signature authority on contracts, right? Uh, I think it was like a million dollar contract I could sign, uh, uh, which was nifty coming right out of school. Um, also did supplier relationship management. And um, I only bring that experience up because a lot of negotiations actually is about relationships and how much credibility you can build with your counterparty. And um, over the last eight years, I've, I've done, I've been in sourcing still doing different roles, um, both on the commercial side of, of, of Amgen as well as the operations and the R&D side more recently. And types of negotiations I've been involved in, been sales contracts, uh, pricing, we've done development agreements, uh, uh, supply agreements, licensing, uh, debt. We've issued debt with some companies or purchased debt. Uh, also done business continuity and risk management. So a uh, big array of activities. I, I, but I will say that um, no two negotiations are the same. So one of the uh, things I love about my role is the fact that every day it's something a little bit different. It's very uh, rare that you could just take something you've done before and reapply it as is. Uh, before I jump, uh, any uh, questions? Would love to take some because I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute as I um, as I fix uh, the slide so that you can see all the answers all at once. No, nothing. I just reiterate that I'm doing something right now. Um, if you are interested in participating in the activity, please do email. Uh, I'll put my email once again in here. Um, email me just, you know, so I can have your email and I can send you one of the sheets to participate in the activity so far. I only have six people and that's good because it's even numbers, but, um, you know, everyone keep, Come, keep on coming it'll be a great activity so um just send you know it can be a blank email just to my email and i will respond with one of the sheets for the activity thank you all right and i am almost done uh, we're imp improvising here so i apologize for that
All right. Perfect. So what will we be going through today is obviously not everything you need to know about negotiations. And um, I do want to uh, just make this very clear up front that um, there's a lot of tactics in negotiations. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. Uh, and it's not ever going to be all encompassing. It's something you will only be able to do as you go through the activities in your everyday life and in your work. Um, there's negotiation training is great. But the reality is the best training is when you're actually doing it live. So so those who are the best at it are not the ones who got the most training, but the ones who have been really the longest, either in the, in the industry or have been doing it the longest just because you build off of experience. So what we're going to go today are just some things that will help you with negotiations as you start off and you start thinking about um, where you want to get a little bit ahead of what you have today. So we'll go through some concepts. Um, we're going to talk about win-lose and win-win scenarios because the, 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 the scenario you're in is very important because it impacts uh, what outcome you're looking for and how you negotiate. And then we're going to go through an activity and then I'll just end it with going through a tool uh, that will, I will also send out. Um, it's something that just helps you think through negotiation before you actually start. So let's start with the concepts, right? So we'll talk about BATNA. Uh, and you, this is probably the most um, known terminology out there if you've ever done negotiations training. Um, do, does anybody know what BATNA is? Just a quick yes would be good uh, as I go through it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the concept of anchoring and what that means. Um, just to briefly talk about zone of potential agreement. Um, and then really the, the two things I want to spend more time on are the concept of value creation and then the concept of managing tension in negotiations, which in most cases we're kind of uh, uh, wired to avoid conflict and to make things go as smoothly as possible, which we see as an element of success in most of our, and our peers might see it as an element of success, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're getting the best outcome. So with that, um, I'm gonna start with uh, best alternative to a negotiated agreement, BATNA, um, and I'm going to really need uh, people to start uh, participating before I start calling on them. Uh, so, uh, Maya, thanks for joining. What do you think BATNA is? And if anybody wants to jump in and help her, that's also great too. See Joe typing? That's right. So if you don't get what you want, what's the next best thing you can get? That's absolutely right. Um, there's a few definitions around it, right? It's um, uh, if you don't take this deal, like what's the other deal that's available to you, right? Um, and But one of the key concepts here is that what you have must be realistic, right? So as you're negotiating and you're thinking of what your BATNA is going into a discussion, you have to make sure that this alternate reality you're thinking of is actually a reality, right? It's not wishful thinking. It's not something more rosy than it is because oftentimes what people do is they romanticize or overvalue this other option they have, which would make them less willing to negotiate at the option in front of them. So it's really important that as you're thinking of what your next BATNA is, or what your alternate is, that you make that alternate as real as possible. And sometimes you may not have it, right? And, and the reason why you need to have a bat night is because it really defines your this concept of walk away. When are you willing to not do this deal anymore? When does it become so unfriendly or so unprofitable or, or, or so, uh, I'll call the world unsexy, right? That it's like, no, I don't need this, right? I'm just going to move away and, and just do something else. Right. The other concept of BATNA is that usually you do your BATNA when you're going to go into a negotiation. It's part of your prep work. Uh, you'll see it in the planning tool. Um, but your BATNA is not static. Right. So sometimes your negotiations take time. It's not done over one phone call. And the reality will be changing over time. And the best example I can give on this is uh, one of the first work uh, uh, projects that I worked on at Amgen was uh, we were trying to renegotiate pricing with actually GE, uh, GE Healthcare. 
Um, and there's this protein we buy from GE. It's called protein A, very simple. Uh, but they had a, uh, you know, they had a patent on it. We could not buy protein A from anybody else. And we're about to go into this five-year agreement to redo pricing on protein A, which we spend millions of dollars on. Um, and we were kind of stuck on how do we make sure that we can still get a deal done because we need the protein. No one else has it. And GE wants to really up the prices. So how do we balance that? But as we were going through the uh, negotiations, it was like seven, eight months in, we realized that not only that their patent was about to expire in two years, but we found an alternate company that was already developing this once the patent expired. So all of a sudden, this changed from you know a sole source situation where GE, where we had no BATNA, the BATNA was not producing Amgen products, which was not acceptable, to, yeah, we don't have an alternate today, but in two years, that reality changes. So if you're going into a five-year agreement, that really changes your leverage position with the company, with, with, with GE. And because of that, we were able to be kind of crafty in the way we set a five-year pricing, for example, by committing to not develop something with this other supplier, right? Which was not an option when we first started this agreement. And had we kind of ran through it, negotiations, and tried to get it as fast as possible, you may have missed out on that opportunity, right? And then uh, as part of the BATNA is you're, when you're doing the planning tool at the end, it's, a, it's definitely an input, a key input. But one thing you have to remember that you're not the only one who has a BATNA. So the party you are negotiating against also has a BATNA, right? And the more you can understand about their BATNA, or at least try to figure out ways to calculate how they're thinking about BATNA, the more successful you're going to be in what you're doing. Okay. Uh, and I realize, is my screen showing up a little small on your end, or are you okay? All right, so um, anchoring. Um, this is definitely a more vague concept, um, uh, but I think it's still taught in a lot of negotiations classes. So just, uh, again, same thing. Um, Anybody want to volunteer and input on what anchoring is? Holding on to what you want, what you really want. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts? All right. So anchoring is the process of when you're starting negotiations, you have to start somewhere. Right. So you don't just start blank. Somebody has to say something and somebody has to say something first. So the, the concept of anchoring is where do you want to be? Where do you want to set the starting point of discussions? Right. The simplest way to show this is usually pricing because it's very concrete and it's a, uh, a simple concept. Right. So if you're about to buy something. Right. If you're thinking of a price around twenty thousand. Right. You probably want to, if if you if you start it, you probably want to start closer to the twenty thousand, right? Probably less, and then move up. But you're anchoring now the discussion. If you go first, you're anchoring the discussion around the value you put out there, right? Versus if you wait, then the other party could be like, no. Before you even say, I want to buy it for eighteen, they could tell you, I want to. I'm selling this car for twenty eight thousand, right? So if you look at car purchases, right? Used car purchases, for example. They always set the price. It's never like there's no no price, right? Because they're setting where you, they want to have the discussion around. They're kind of putting the ballpark out there that look, we're going to sell around this price. Don't come to us around if a car is like listed at thirty. Don't come to us with a ten thousand dollar deal or an ask because you're we're not going to accept it. They're, that's what the concept of anchoring is, and it's a it's a double edged sword, right? Because if you start the discussion, you can anchor the conversation around where you want to be. Right. And the value you're thinking about. Um, and if you don't, then you let that opportunity to be with the other party for them to do it. 
Um, so there are times where you want to make this first, right? So where you want to be the anchoring is that if you want to force the starting position where you want to be, right? If you want to set the expectations, if you want to drive the tone of the conversation. The downside is if you haven't done the right amount of research, you could be setting the bar at a, two different opposite ways, right? One could be too low. And if you set things too low, you kind of dissuade the other party from even wanting to discuss things with you, right? So you're losing the opportunity to negotiate because you've gone so far off uh, this zone of agreement that we're going to talk about next that the party doesn't want to talk to you or that you have complete or you have wrong information or not enough information and you might set it too high. So you might actually be negotiating against yourself because you have the wrong information. So this concept of anchoring really, if, if you have the information, if you've done your market research, if you know where things need to be, right? And then you have information about the other party. For example, if you're again, car buying, right? It's the end of the month, the end of the year, they're trying to close their books. They're more likely to make a deal. You can probably start at a better position. Those are in, this is information you have, right? You've done research and you know that this is a reality. But if you don't know this, Right? You might set it too high, or if you've done research that doesn't counter all the elements, you might give a price that's too high. And the number one way of figuring that out is if your deal gets done too quickly, you probably started off the wrong place, right? And you're technically at a loss now. And either your chance, either your option is, you know, burn the relationship and walk away after you've negotiated or accept the deal as you kind of negotiated it, okay? Um, any questions on this um, and this inform this idea of information and prep work is going to be kind of throughout this work because no one shoots from the hip when you're negotiating, right? Your ability to be effective has a lot to do with how much prep you've done and how much training and how much information you've been able to gather ahead of getting into a discussion with somebody. Joe, you're typing something? Uh, anybody else have a question? Or would you like to move on? Yes, you can You can have a strong anchor if you have sufficient information. There's always a little bit of asymmetry, uh, but it depends on um, how critical is the information that's asymmetric, right? So you might not have all the information, but if you have the critical set of information, the others are just information that helps probably manage the edges of your negotiation, not the core. And sometimes you have a lot of asymmetry and you can't do it, right? And you probably don't want to anger, anchor at that point, yeah. All right, so the zone of potential agreement, right, is, is really, and I'm just gonna go through it because I wanna give more time for the activity because I think that's a lot more revealing. Um, so. The zone of potential agreement is really, do your BATNAs overlap, right? Is, is there a region where both parties want to agree? And I would say that just like your BATNA is not uh, uh, static and is dynamic, your range of acceptance is also dynamic because if your BATNA changes, this range changes as well, right? And part of your role as a negotiator is to make sure that you elongate your counterparty's BATNA as much as possible before you start really digging into where you wanna be. Because if you can get that their range to be longer, you're more likely one, to get a deal done, but two, to get a deal done on the lower end of your own personal range, right? And uh, the, the best example around these I can give is, and this is where you don't wanna anchor right up front, is in, in a lot of negotiations, I said a lot of time kind of showing what the value of what we're doing is, regardless of where, where how much we're gonna pay for something and what it means and all that, right? I spent a lot of time building relationship, what it means for them to be in a relationship with Amgen, because those are the things that now start elongating that counterparty's range of acceptance They're, that they might not have done before because they did not have information, just like you did not have information, right? Uh, any questions?
Okay. So uh, the concept of value creation uh, is probably, uh, this is the most subjective, right? Uh, and this is something that is not often taught uh, because it's just not easy to teach. It's something you're gonna learn when you're doing. But I think if you have the concepts around what it means, you can start exercising it and start understanding what meaning it can bring you. So my first question is, any guesses on what, what value creation is? Okay, so in the, usually the, the example I do in a class is, is super simple, right? There's always somebody sitting up front that has a water bottle and I just go to them and I say, can I have your water bottle? And your first instinct is, I'm not drinking my water bottle, it's in front of me, he's asking from it, for me, I just give it to, I, they just give it to me, right? Um, and what that means to me is as, as the person who got the bottle is, this bottle had no value for you. That's why you were so willing to give it up and give it to me without anything, right? And the simplest thing could, could have been, why do you want my bottle, right? Um, and I know it, it was like, okay, what value does that give you? Well, it gave you information, right? Um, and you don't know if that information is valuable or not, but you won't know it un unless you ask for the information and you got it. I might have told you I'm super thirsty. There's nothing that big a deal. I might have told you I think there's gold in this bottle, right? And you just don't know it, for example. And, and really that's the whole concept of value creation is that it is up to you to create value for everything you're giving to the other party, right? If it's information you're giving, if it's a concession you're doing, often I see parties just kind of, you know, conceding that, okay, you can have this with, without asking for anything in return, right? And if you do that, then it means what I got was not that valuable to you. So I'm not even going to count it as, a, as something I want. Right, because you didn't want it, I just got it, right? So I'm just gonna keep asking for more until I get, you show the value of what I'm getting and then get something back from me, right? Who doesn't want a free thing? Um, and really a lot of the success is how much can you create that value? Because that's also part of elongating that batna about what you're giving to people, right? If, if for example, if I'm giving you a $2 bill, yeah, face value, it's $2, but I can create a value around how unique this bill is. There's not a lot of it. So really, yeah, I'm giving you $2, but it's kind of worth $5 in my view. I'm going to ask for something around $5 back, right? And obviously, I'm not telling them this. I'm just creating the value, and then I'm asking for something more than I gave, right? And uh, what is one way where this is really important in your everyday job, especially when you're starting off? new in a company or you're less senior. It also works when you're more senior, but there's definitely ways where this works in your favor when you're less senior. Anybody want to venture a guess? Yeah. Uh, how many of you are in project management? I'm, I'm going to guess a few. Um, have any of you been ever asked like, hey, give me the timeline on this project? Just some executive comes to you and he's like, give me the timeline on this project. Serge, have you given them the timeline? Did you ask for anything or you just gave them the timeline? Yeah. So the first thing I usually would do is, uh, why do you need this timeline or how are you gonna use this information? Right, and it might not be a lot to you right now, but it makes it valuable in a way that you at least got some information back and you don't know if that information is valuable or not. It could be that they say, oh, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna present this at a board meeting, right? And you could have said, well, do I have an opportunity to join that given I did the work, right? Or it could be very simple, like, oh, I'm just doing a regular update and I wanted to know. And then now that you know it's an update to an executive you and that you probably can't participate in, you could say, just want to highlight that we did X, Y, Z that really shortened this. And then you're now showing, not just are you giving them a timeline, but you also took this, this moment to learn well, how it's being used. And then you put a plug for yourself or for your team, if you're managing the team, of what they want to highlight for their bosses. And this happens all the time. You get an email, especially at a lower level, where yeah, we want something for you, from you, right? My number one ask of even my teams is, if somebody is asking you for something, your first question is, why are, you, why are you asking it, right? Because it might just give you information around what's happening in the company, 
right? And that's important too, because as you connect with people, you start becoming more of an information holder, as in you understand and can connect the dots. And I know this is a very fine point, but in many companies, especially bigger companies, connecting the dots is probably the biggest value you can get because there's so many silos and information is one of the ways where you can help connect those dots. Any questions on this? I can give one more like very basic example around when you're selling, I'm gonna go back to the cars because most of you will probably negotiate when you're buying cars is, you know, you might have a car that's a little bit old, right? You could sell it as an old car or you can make the case for it that actually this isn't an old car. It, it could be an antique, right? You feel like this could be an antique. And if you create that value for your car, this is something you're creating, it doesn't exist, right? You could sell it at that value. Right. And then it obviously you have to make sure you have the right information. You can't be bullshitting all the way through. Bullshitters always get caught at some point. Um, and like the one thing when we go to the exercise is that if assume that somebody else can listen in on this conversation and make sure you're conducting that conversation in a manner that you would be OK if other people heard it. OK, that would be the, the kind of the one thing as we go through this. OK. And then the last topic here is. I'm just going to go through it, is that silence is golden. Uh, so usually, just some of the uh, behavioral uh, aspects of the role when you're negotiating is that, one, you have to be clear when you ask for something, and it has to be specific, OK? But most people ask something, and then they continue with 10 sentences after they've already done their ask, right? So because they feel like the party might not have understood or like they didn't get the response they wanted or the physical facial response. So now you're blabbering on. And what that does is you're now giving more information, right? You're not allowing the other party to actually have a minute to think about it. So when you have asks, you just make them clear, you say it, and then you shut up. That's my most basic rule, right? You just shut up. You made your ask, you let them come to you with what's next, right? You're confident with your ask, you, you, they might ask you, why are you doing this ask or what is it based on? And then you can get more information, but just do your ask and then stop. And then this is very uncomfortable because there are calls where there's moments of silence that I just don't say anything, right? Because I asked my question and I made the ask, it's up to them to respond. And, and it can sound combative, but as long as you don't make it personal and you don't re make it reactive and it's just, you're just waiting for a response, right? then you can kind of diffuse it and you can also be the one being in control, right? The, the tension is necessary, right? I have done negotiations where they've ended like very amicably and very quickly. And my takeaway from those have been, I did not a good, do a good job, right? It happened quickly, it happened as fast as it needed to be, but it was too smooth, right? Which means either I didn't ask enough or they didn't ask enough, right? So it means somebody left a lot on the table, okay? Um, so the way you can manage this tension of the silence and putting things there where you want, it could be hard asks, right? But that silence allows you to create tension, right? You need to make parties uncomfortable a little bit because they need to get out of their comfort shoes to start thinking more broadly and more outside of the box and how they want to get back to you, right? Just remember negotiations are not personal. That's why you can't usually negotiate with your spouses and your kids because you're very emotionally tied. Right. But in a work environment, it's not emotional. It's not personal. Right. So just keep that in mind. And, and this ability of you creating and resolving tension. Right. I think of it as a rubber band in your hands. Um, uh, and I, I know one of you is going to enjoy this. Well, it, it, it's you're always like almost like the puppet master of the situation. You're now in control of what is happening. You're not allowing yourself to react to something. You're always making them react to things. And vice versa, if you're negotiating with somebody who knows what they're doing, you now understand that this is also a way to manage and create tension. So you could either diffuse it or make it a neutral playing ground by understanding what's happening and also not overreacting and also being clear and very specific in your responses and also being silent. Okay, uh, It's very awkward. Uh, I would say if any of you have done sales uh, or have not done sales, uh, the one experience I took out of GE and my sales experience was I was in awkward situations all the time and I just got used to it. And then people have a tough time getting used to awkward situations. And the only way you're going to get used to it is if you're in a bunch of awkward situations, right? It's just, it is what it is. Yeah. 
Um, any questions before we jump to the next topic, which is the win-lose and the win-win, which is probably uh, an area most of you know. Uh, we're just running a little bit out of time, so I'm, I'm gonna go through it. So win-lose is there's a fixed pi, right? If you get A plus one, the other party is gonna get A minus one, right? So you're gonna get a little, they're gonna get a little less. Usually these are one-time relationships. Uh, there's no uh, long-term continuity uh, of the relationship. Car buying could be one, right? Buying a house could be one because you're never going to deal with that seller again uh, or selling a house, right? You're never going to deal with that buyer again. But in your careers, most of your work is going to be in a win-win situation, whether you're negotiating with bosses, with colleagues, with other companies, none of you are going to disappear from each other's daily lives or you know encounters once you're done negotiating. And this is where you can really make the pie bigger than it originally appears, right? You could create value beyond what's already there. In project management, you can share resources to do more, right, while you're negotiating, versus each one of you fighting for a resource and there's no budget for it, you could be sharing a resource. These are negotiations, right? Um, it gives parties a better endpoint that they had started that they could get, right? It really expands the pie. And really, it's for situations where you know you're going to have continued discussions over time. This is not a one-time deal. You're going to negotiate on something else in two months and something else in four months. So you really need to make sure you're thinking of the long-term view and you're also thinking of the win-win. And one of the things that you're not only thinking about your win, right? This is where you also need to help them understand what their win is, right? If you were in the previous storytelling workshop, right? How you tell the story about what this means helps big create this bigger pie and realize the value that you know they are winning too they're winning more than they thought they're winning right they might not be getting a better price or better terms but they're winning in other ways or they're getting better terms at a worse price whatever it is you can help communicate what that win is okay so this is the activity we're going to quickly jump into you everybody got uh an email by now if not uh you'll be getting an email very shortly reem just let me know when you sent out the email in, in the chat right uh we're probably not going to have 10 minutes to prep we're going to probably have around five to eight minutes to prep so uh reem are you going to the next work uh are you going to negotiations v yes um let me put i'm going to share my screen sev if that's okay just to show yeah. the groups everyone's received an email and the, everyone is already grouped so i will share my screen and just show who's matched with who and then um, or what group, I guess what group everyone is in. Um, all right, so this is my screen. This is our, we have, okay. So we have group A, Joe, Hiba, Katie, and Simon, and group B, um, Serge, Rima, Muhammad, and Ani. Um, group B, please leave this room and go to negotiations B, which is another session, and I will meet you there and we will do a debrief. Um, and then group A, stay here. And after I do the, the debrief with group B, we'll come back all together and talk about what the activity is gonna be, and then we'll send you off. So I hope that sounds okay, Sev. Let me know. Um, I'll head out and you guys meet me there. Thank okay. you. Okay, let's just give a minute for everybody to be out. All right, I think everybody is out already. So let me share my screen. You today will be doing a, a, a real estate transaction. And uh, let me share my screen. You all, if you got the email, please open it up as well. I mean, I'm gonna share my screen, but it might be not as legible. I'll, I'll try to make it as legible as possible. All right, so uh, you're the buyer, right? You're, very quickly, you, you work as part of a company called uh, LCN Bio. It's a very reputable biotechnology. It's the largest in the US. Uh, they're trying to build a uh, visitor center and they need to buy a property in order to build it. Um, their whole headquarters in the city, they wanna stay in the city and um, they've built a whole campus around this lot. They just have one piece of land that they haven't been able to buy, right? Um, 
So as part of LCN Bio, they're, they're located in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, right? It's an actual city in, in Pennsylvania. They want to stay in the community. They've been there for a long time. It's important to them that they stay. And, uh, and uh, they, they've been there for a long time. They want to benefit the local community. Uh, there's key suppliers in the area for them, so they don't want to move their headquarters in manufacturing. Right? There's a lot of good universities for them to bring in talent uh, from around there. There's tax incentives and the cost of property is fairly low, as well as the cost of living, which, which is an attractive piece for when, when they're trying to hire people to come into the area. Right? Uh, there's been a lot of growth in the company. They went from one building to 10 uh, and they've now taken over an entire city block, except for that one piece of land where the buyer did not or the seller, the owner did not sell it to them uh, a few years ago. Okay, so now they're expanding, right? They want to create a visitor center that helps them showcase the innovation they've done. They want to do seminars with the medical societies around them. They want to leverage the space for recruiting processes. Also want to create a space so that as they come meet with suppliers, they have an area to meet that's separate, uh, you know, more secure than having build, meeting in actual buildings where there could be proprietary information. So the board of directors has approved. They want to build this visitor center on that one area that they haven't bought yet on the city lot. Um, the leadership team is committed to making this center work. Their actual bonuses for the year uh, depend on it. Okay. There's also other benefits because today there's buildings on both sides of this property and they're not connected to each other and having this visitor center in the middle also allows them to connect uh, across, the, across the two groups. Okay. Uh, just a little bit about the seller. Uh, he's retired 10 years ago. He's alone. He's very private. Not, not much known, known about him. We know his wife passed away two years ago uh, from an illness. Um, we don't know if he has kids. It seems like he's financially sufficient, but there doesn't appear that he's wealthy. Uh, they've been in Lebanon. His family has been in Lebanon, Pennsylvania for generations. Uh, they actually tried to buy this from him years ago. They offered... $2 million, which is about 15% over market rate at the time, and he did not agree. Uh, so these are your directions from the board of the LCN Bio. They we're willing, the company is willing to offer up to $8 million, but no more for the lot. Uh, we've done a private appraisal. It's worth about four and a half. So the eight million is actually a big premium over the current market price. Um, they're willing to accept any other options as long as the cost remains under eight million you have to make a deal, right? You cannot come back not making a deal. Okay, uh, any questions? And the four people who, or the five people who were uh, going to do the uh, activity, who gave their emails, can you just maybe quickly feel free to ask, request to participate. There's only five of us right now, so I could see you. If you have questions, I'm happy to. Reem, do you mind in the meantime uh, showing the slide of, uh, of the individual members so that they can know who to call? Yes, absolutely. I'm getting it. All right. So I'm on our negotiation slide. Uh, the best way that we can do this is basically group B, which was my group here, um, oh, we already talked about, sorry, group B, which is the buyer, sellers, excuse me, you're going to call the buyers group A. So what you're going to do is um, in balloon on your right hand side, you go all the way to the right, there's a people's tab. So um, just search your person in the tab and 
can click on their name and you can directly video call them so that um, you can conduct your like one-on-one -on -one negotiation. And um, and then we'll give it maybe four minutes, seven minutes of, what do you think? I know we're running late on time. Um, and then come back here. Reem, do we have time after this workshop? Like, is there a gap a little we bit? We do because it's it's a lunch break. Yeah, so, so if you want to go over, that's yeah, totally okay. fine. If, if everybody's okay with it, given that there's nothing on the back end of this, let's take the 10 minutes, but please dial back into this room or end your conversation at exactly one o'clock Pacific time and then come back here. That's the deadline. If you've made a deal, you've made it. If you haven't, you haven't. And then come back here at one o'clock. All right, so uh, does everybody, can you put the slide back up so they know who to call? Right? Yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So please, uh, group B, whoever is in group B, so Ramsey, please do a video chat with Joe, right? Sorry, search, do a video chat with Joe. Rima, do a video chat with Hiba. Muhammad, please call Katie. And Eli, please call Simon. Okay? All right, please. Good luck. Sounds good. I'll be back at 1 o'clock.
Hi, how are you? Good, good. I put it kind of a large order for 2.30. Just want to make sure you guys will be delivering it by 2.30, not like making it at 2.30. Uh, it's a box, this one, or set. It, it's about like 14 plates or 13 plates. I think so, yeah. So it will be delivered at, yeah, will it be delivered at 2.30, right? Or, okay, it will be delivered at 2.30, perfect, thank you. All right, hoping people start trickling in. Um, I don't know if uh, Reem or Lee, there's a way to message people, let them know it's time. Oh, hey, Joe. Wow, no deal. Shame.
Curious to hear what happened. One more. Katie. Katie and Haman. Okay, but Katie's back, I think. All right, so Katie, what there's two people who had a deal, it, it seems like, two no deals. Hold on. Okay, so Joe, uh, I see you said and a donation and a memorial. I don't get it. So let's start. Joe and Serge, you said no deal, right? Um, okay. Oh, by the way, please uh, feel free to request to participate. I think it'll be better if you actually talk uh, versus Diane here. Hey, Joe. Hey, so um, essentially Serge and Crystal uh, wanted nine million to start, and they wanted the visitor center. Well, I offered the visitor center be named after her spouse. She wanted that and a donation to cancer treatment, and twice the fair market value based on our appraisal. And then she went down a quarter million, and it was just not doable before the time was up. So I had to walk away. All right. So Sir and Crystal did not follow the rules. I was willing to offer one and a half times the fair market value. And the donation and the memorial? And the memorial. I didn't, we could have given a donation too, but we didn't agree on a price of our value of that. Okay. Did you offer, did you offer housing, Joe? Uh, no, but given that we were going to give more than the fair market value. That was enough. Okay. That was enough, we thought. How much did you offer dollar wise? Uh, five point between five point five to six million. Okay, so you technically had a deal, Crystal. You should have accepted. But don't it. take anything below seven point five. Offer seven point five. Didn't he offer seven point five? No, I offered between five point five and six. No, I know, but but remember, it says if he gives you the naming, the donation. If he if he names this visitor center, one of these two can oh, oh, oh one of these two conditions. One All right. Had a deal. <laughs> so, Joe, your deal was what? Seven? Uh, what was it? Five and a half? Five and a half to six. One of these plus, two. Uh, plus, uh, so we memorial. Have memorial. plus memorial. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Hiba. How are yes. you all? Hey, Hiba. Yep. Okay. Um, so, we had a deal, but based on what I'm hearing, I don't know if I had to go that far. <laughs> okay. um, our deal was seven and a half million, and then naming the the visitor center after the wife. Okay. Katie or Mohammed. All right. Thanks you. And just stay on. It's fine. We're, we can have a live discussion since oh, there's only a few of us. Okay. Hey, Katie. Hi. Um, we have the same deal as Hiba and Rima. So 7.5 with the memorial. Okay. Simon or Simon Ali. Are they on? Are they back? Eli, no, which of you? So, Eli, Simon, any of you here? Um, I don't think, I think Simon hopped off, so Eli didn't end up pairing with him. Okay. So we can oh. scratch that one. <laughs> oh, so no deal, right? Um, I'm curious, why are the numbers so high? How did you, so the people who were buying, um, when did you bring up the dollar discussion? So Joe, for example, you, you're a buyer. When did you bring up the money? Yeah, so uh, brought up the money after we brought up, like I, I strategically was like, I want to talk about you, your family. Okay. And I want to know how long you've been in the community and then talk about the value of the home and then talk about price. So second or third. 
Okay. Uh, Hiba? My strategy was similar to Joe's. So um, I gave background. I let uh, Rima talk about like um, what was going, like what she felt and why she wanted to keep it. And then I went based off of that and said how it could be a benefit even more if we were to take it over and what we could do for her before mentioning the money. Um, and then I think it was second or third that I brought up the money as well. Okay. Uh, and uh, we don't have a, uh, Katie, what about you? When did you uh, talk about the money? Similarly, we started out with introductions and then I tried to anchor it at the beginning by just listing what the market value price was. Um, and then Hamad countered with an offer of 7.5 and that was like fine with me. So we just agreed on that. Okay. Um, how many of you would be surprised if I told you you could have gotten this for zero dollars? Right, so I know you, you didn't have a lot of time, but the your sellers were willing to give this to you for free as long as you named the memorial after their wife and you took care of their housing. So not entirely free, but looking at housing is about 30,000, the, the, the sellers knew. So you offered somewhere around half to $1 million, they would have accepted, or if you had given them housing, right, either or. Um, so, and, 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 and the key here is that uh, for those of I know there's not a lot of time, so I will acknowledge that. But for those of you who anchored around dollars or money, you missed the opportunity to understand they didn't sell this two years ago, even when we offered more money, right? So what is it that's going to make them be able to, instead of sell the property, give the property or make it available so that it serves a bigger purpose, right? So if you went down that path of discussion to understand first, Right. You were more likely to get a lower number like Joe did, for example, who first talked about, you know, how are they, their background. Right. They were more willing to probably Crystal should have accepted. Right. But she was being a lawyer trying to win. Right. Which was not the point of this exercise, because one of the elements in the in the uh, in the briefs were that you had ties to the community. Right. Both, you know, the seller and the buyer both felt like the community is part of their bigger ecosphere, right? They've been there for generations. If you were the seller, you had lived there for a long time, multiple generations, right? So you, the house is not just about the money and living somewhere else. You probably want to stay in the area. It was important to you. The land had sentimental value. If you were the buyer, you know, your company started in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. There's a lot of reason why you want to stay in Pennsylvania. You know, your employees were like family members and they all grew up there, etc. So if you don't understand these nuances, you're more likely going to make the deal about the money than what really motivates people to actually come to an agreement. And if you didn't do a deal, you would have gone fired, right? So the five and a half and the seven and a half are not bad deals because guess what? Your board told you you could do it under eight and you got it done under eight. So congratulations if you made a deal, that's excellent. But I just want to give you the other element here is that it, I told you you can get it for free, but you still succeeded. Right, because one of your key conditions was your board told you you have to make a deal, right? So if you came back at a no deal, that was failure. You were probably gotten fired, right? And they would put someone else on this and then paid even ten million dollars now to get it done, right? Um, so just you have to think of all the elements, the timing you have. Who are you trying to satisfy? Uh, don't try to be a maverick, right? This isn't I'm going to get the best deal and I'm going to show how good I am to the company. It's meeting the company goals. Right, which sometimes isn't as good as it can be, but hey, that's what we need to get done. Right, there's multiple times where we pay a lot more for something that I know it's worth because hey, it was really important for the company to have continuity of supply and they were willing to pay for it. It's not up to me to say, don't pay for it. It's up to me to show the numbers, to, to evaluate what it could look like and up to the leaders to make a decision and then for me to get it done, right? So don't be a maverick. That was like the last thing I wanted to kind of say. If you went into this as a win-win situation, you're not. if you're going in to win, you're going to come out losing one way or the other. If you're going in to make everybody winners, you're more likely to succeed at an area where you didn't think was even possible. Okay? So this concept of figuring out what is it that drives people, it's what I, we terms called elegant negotiable. These are things that aren't evident. Right, that aren't something you can do as part of your bat, not something you can even figure out with research. Right, these are things you uncover through conversation, through uncovering the needs that people have the, versus the wants. And the beauty about all of us is we're very, very quick to tell what we want from people, but very difficult to really share or even know what we need. Sometimes we don't even know what we need. 
right? Until we think through, we don't know what we need. So part of your negotiations is to really uncover what is the other party needing? What do they really need versus what are they telling me they want? Okay, only way you can do this is if you ask questions and if you listen, okay? Uh, just some, and, and uh, just wanted to give you an example here. Just because people are senior in the company doesn't mean they do negotiations well. There's been multiple times where I've gone and asked people to no longer join calls because they think they know a lot about the subject matter that is at hand, but they have no idea about how to get what they want, right? And they can offer derail you. So if people are in you negotiating, they have to be on the same page as you. They have to understand what their role to speak is. And you have to be comfortable to tell them, no, you cannot join, right? We will debrief afterwards. And this has happened multiple times um, in my negotiations where some leader wanted to go in thinking he knows what he's doing, right? Only that we come out of the meeting because he said something he shouldn't have and gave something he shouldn't have given and agreed to something that we were not ready to agree on. And then now like, lost us a lot of leverage. So people in the room with you have to be on the same page as you, synced with you, make sure they're not saying anything they're not supposed to be saying. How yeah. do you have that conversation, Sev? Because there's a, clearly a power dynamic if someone is your boss or you know C-suite level and you're telling them, you are telling them like, yo, don't, you're messing this up. Yeah, one of, the, one of the main ways where, at least in my role, Right. So it depends on everybody's role. Right. Um, I am in a function that supports the business. Right. So we have operations teams, R&D teams, commercial teams. I am not part of any of their teams. I'm a person that helps them achieve their goals. Right. One of the benefits of my role is I can always step out when I'm done. Right. So usually I, how I would say, especially when usually those situations also get contentious. Right. There's difficulty. There's tension. There's churn. Right. But I don't have to maintain this relationship moving forward. I have to make, get the deal done so that others can live with it and operate it. So usually my approach is, look, I'm going to, when this is done, I can leave, right? I can do the next thing, but you can't leave. This, we're doing this agreement for you. You're going to have to operate it. And if you damage it too much, you're not going to be successful leading it moving forward. So that's usually one of my ways, right? Or I also bring up examples of what have happened. And I don't put it as, oh, you didn't blame it. More around, it's impossible to get them on the same page as you. They have limited time to meet with you, right? They have limit, they have a hundred other things going on other than this negotiation, right? And they don't have the mental space to be as ready as you are, who's living in the working team, who've been living it day to day, right? So it's more about, look, it's impossible to get you ready. It's about, we're gonna lose leverage because of that. And it's more about, I can move away and walk away when I'm done. Cause really my role is to get this done. And then I can do something else. And that has happened. We, I've had one relationship where it was so difficult to negotiate that by the time we were done, I literally replaced myself with someone else. And I said, I can no longer be in this relationship, right? Someone else is going to step in to continue the day to day. And I'm going to be done because I just had people at the other company did not like me anymore. Right. And if it's not good for my company, right? So I got the deal done and it was time for me to leave and someone else to operate it. So it, those are like the elements that come to my mind. Okay, so just some final thoughts, right? 90% of the work is planning. There's no glorious, uh, uh, I don't know, you probably have watched legal shows about negotiation and all these like hoo-hahs and whatnot. It doesn't happen that way. 90% of the work is planning and being ready for the discussion. Um, don't dwell on things you've lost or sunk cost, how much time you've dedicated. Um, I, I, uh, one of the things I see a lot happening is sometimes things take so long. And you're like, oh my God, it's taking so long. I just, I'm just going to do it and get done with it. You end up conceding everything in the last five minutes of a discussion, right? When you've been working for a year to get something done, right? In the right way, right? So patience, making sure you're thinking of the long game, making your bit, people you're supporting understand why this could take so long and what are we gaining by taking so long. Don't dwell on what's it's taken. Just think of what it's going to take to get to the next step, right? Information is leverage, how you get it, how you use it, right? Uh, you have to create value for what you're giving. Like, I cannot stress this enough, okay? Focus on needs, listen, talk less than you need to. Uh, don't say the word but, right? How many times have you heard things? I, I, I hear what you're saying, but, right? It's like a way of us acknowledging that we heard. But the first thing you're saying, and the first thing you're saying is, yeah, I heard you, but you're an idiot and I'm going to tell you something else, right? I heard you, but I'm not agreeing and I'm doing something else. Learn to use the word and instead of but, right? I understand what you're saying that you needed at, at this. 
and I have other things I need to take care of. So I cannot do it at that value, right? And I have to do this or, and I, if you consider this factor, then what you're saying is not as valuable, right? It's, it's difficult, right? Train, just try it in a couple of conversations intentionally and just see how the outcome of the person working with you, like their reaction to you changes because you're no longer saying, I stopped hearing you. I heard you and I'm no longer processing it, right? You're saying, I heard you and I'm adding to it versus stopping it and like restarting something else. Um, the pie is always bigger than what it looks like, right? You guys saw it in the negotiation. You could have gotten it for $0. You could have, for those who got to the memorial, very good job, not everybody gets to that, right? And then the last thing is manage the tension, learn to shut up when you need to, when you've given your ass, don't negotiate against yourself, stop talking, okay? Um, with that, thank you. Um, there's a planning tool that uh, Reem will send out. And by the way, Reem, please feel free to send it out to everybody, not just people in this uh, in this workshop, right? It's very simple. Like what's your BATNA, their BATNA, what are important information you need, new information you're gathering, things you can give, things you can ask, right? Just things that help you. And, you know, I have target price, but you could do target terms, whatever is you know, appropriate for the situation you're in. Writing them down helps. I always write things down before I go into the conversation. Okay, there's prep work. I don't wing it. Okay. With that, thank you uh, everyone for attending and going through the exercise. Uh, just remember that you're only going to get good at this as you do it. Um, even if you think you're not going to succeed, still negotiate because when there will be a time where you can succeed and you need to, and that's not when you want to be the first time negotiating. Right, have a lot of failures, learn from them, do them all the time. And then when it's important, you'll actually have the experience and you'll be much more confident about the outcome. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Enjoy the lunch. I'm sorry we went 20 minutes over. Uh, we'll think of making this maybe longer uh, if we do it again. Uh, uh, it's worth the time and if the schedule allows it, schedules are always tough. But uh, enjoy the rest of the convention and thanks for joining.